Hello, and welcome to Technology and Space, where we talk about the science, technology, history, and business of space exploration and commercialization. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with David Chudwin, author of I Was a Teenage Space Reporter from Apollo 11 to Our Future in Space, published April 2019 by LID Publishing. Thank you for speaking with me. It's a pleasure to be here, Chris. So first, tell me about your background in space. Well, I was born in 1950, uh, which I guess makes me 70 years old now. Mm -hmm. But um, that was a, a well-timed event uh, in the sense that um, I was seven years old uh, when the Russians launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in, engendered in me in a really intense interest in uh, space exploration, uh, which has uh, continued to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, a, um, as a young child, uh, my first space book was a 1958 publication called Space Pilots by the German Willy Ley. Mm -hmm. uh, and I read science fiction uh, novels by uh, Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov as, as a kid in the 1950s. And so when the uh, first American astronauts were named the original seven in April 1959, uh, this brought a real sense of reality to these dreams of flying in space. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the book, one third of the book is about your um, history as being a 19-year-old college journalist uh, who covered the launch um, in July 1969. And can you tell me how that came about, how you got that opportunity? Right. Well, um, a, a good friend of mine uh, um, named Marv Rubenstein, who I'd known since the fifth grade, uh, we got together in December 1968 when we were on break from college. And uh, um, he, he said to me, why don't we go see a Saturn V launch? And I said, well, that, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Uh, at that point, uh, the first manned Saturn V launch had taken place with Apollo 8, which sent the astronauts uh, in orbit around the moon. Mm -hmm. And so we thought about going uh, during our uh, summer college break uh, in summer 1969 to, to see a launch. So I suggested, why don't we try and get uh, press credentials? Uh, I, at that time, was a, a reporter for the Michigan Daily, the independent student newspaper at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if we could get a press credential, we'd have uh, amazing access, more than the hundreds of thousands of people who usually would come to, to see a launch there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were um, two main obstacles. One was getting approval from the senior editors of the Daily, because I was just a rising sophomore then, and uh, sending uh, someone... Uh, junior like myself to see a rocket launch was not high in their budget priorities. So they agreed that I could cover the launch if I would pay for mm. all the expenses of going down there. Mm. And uh, having solved that, the more difficult problem was getting NASA to approve press credentials for a college journalist because before that they never did that. They considered college journalists as uh, students uh, as such. And um, what uh, helped me out was that uh, one of the senior editors of the Daily, a guy named Jim Heck, uh, was going to be the summer editor for what was called the College Press Service, which was a group of over 500 college newspapers, and he was going to be located in Washington that summer. So he went to bat for me and my friend uh, with NASA Public Affairs Office and convinced them that we weren't covering it just for a single university newspaper. We were covering it for all of them. Hmm. And uh, I was lucky enough that they relented, and my friend and I had, uh, had press passes uh, to cover Apollo 11. It seems that uh, you uh, took advantage of an opportunity that maybe a lot of other students weren't even thinking about doing. You know, maybe they didn't have the, um, the kutzpa, if, that, if that's the word. I can use to um to to do something like that. Does is that the case? Right. Well, you know, I I've always believed in uh, in aiming high and also taking advantage of opportunities. But a lot of uh, what allowed me to cover the Apollo Eleven launch was was just good luck. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when when we flew down there, 
uh, from Chicago to the Melbourne, Florida airport, which was the main airport then, uh, we um, looked at the airport and we saw right in front of us was Rose Cernan, uh, astronaut Eugene Cernan's mother. Hmm. And we just happened to recognize her because we had been at a uh, event after Cernan's Gemini flight in uh, 1966 and, and recognized her and said hello to her. We talked to her. Well, when we landed in Florida, she introduced us to five astronauts there who were picking her up, uh, as well as other family members. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, within 20 minutes of landing in Florida, we met with three astronauts who would later walk on the moon, Alan Bean, uh, Charlie Duke and uh, Jim Irwin mm -hmm. and Bruce McCandless, who did the first untethered spacewalk. But this was the kind of luck that we had. Uh, it was a very auspicious start to our trip mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to to see them, talk to them, and, and take photographs. So that answers a question I was going to ask, which was uh, when you were a college reporter uh, before the Apollo launch that you um, witnessed in 1969, July 1969, were you already writing articles on the space program? Yes, uh, I, I did. Um, I uh, wrote an editorial after the uh, first manned Apollo launch, Apollo 7. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote another um, editorial, uh, which I called The Case for Outer Space, uh, advocating a strong space program. And again, this was very atypical for my uh, colleagues at the Michigan Daily, who were uh, somewhat left-wing politically and uh, who had minimal interest in, in space, but uh, hmm. they kind of let me do my thing. Hmm. I didn't realize that at the time the space program had uh, that much of a political uh, bent to it. Well, uh, among some quarters it did. Um, the, the space program and NASA were seen as part of the military industrial complex that was waging the very much hated war in Vietnam at the time. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so that uh, some people kind of lumped them together. Uh, there was also a similar concern about uh, the uh, future of technology, that the technology uh, embolized, uh, symbolized by the, the space program was going to uh, take us all over and we'd become robots. Uh, Admittedly, this is a little bit of an extreme view, but uh, this was some of what I faced uh, among uh, the um, journalists uh, that I worked with. Hmm, that's fascinating. That's something you never hear about now when people talk about the history of the space program. That, that part, I don't think, ever comes up. So do you know how many other college students across the country or even internationally were covering um, space issues? Well, in terms of the Apollo 11 launch, um, I was and, and my friend Marv were the only ones accredited as members of the college press as such, because as I mentioned earlier, NASA previously had not uh, given accreditation to college press. Now, there were about a half dozen other um, teenagers or so who were there working for other uh, news organizations, uh, and uh, the... Um, Probably the youngest person there uh, was uh, who had press credentials. Uh, we found out later was age fifteen, and he lied about his age <laughs> to get the press credentials. Mm -hmm. uh, which, so I guess he was in high school, right? Um, yeah. Do you know? Do you remember what school he was from? Uh, was no, he... no, I don't. Hmm. Interesting. So but it's, it's it's interesting for the. Um, for the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, Apollo 11, uh, some of the original teenage space reporters uh, went down there. Uh, there were about a half dozen of them. And uh, there was a sign that was put up saying, Welcome Dinosaur Press Corps. Hmm. Dinosaur Press Corps. So tell me then, uh, when you got there, um, can you sort of summarize what, what was it like before the launch? How did they, um, you know, did they it, have... It, it was it was an absolute whirlwind three days of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we uh, went on uh, two separate uh, press tours that took us to the top of the vehicle assembly building, took us right next to the base of the Saturn V rocket. I was like 100 yards away from it, uh, that of, of ones that were being stacked. 
in the vehicle assembly building. Uh, it took us to uh, the floor of the firing rooms of the launch control center, the roof of the launch control center, the roof of the vehicle assembly building, right next to the uh, to the transporter crawlers, uh, and took us uh, within about 2,000 feet of the Apollo 11 Saturn V itself. Uh, we saw the wire escape system uh, that led to a bunker and armored carriers in case the astronauts had to escape from the top of the, the launch tower. It was just a whirlwind of activities. Um, there were several press conferences. Uh, one of the most memorable ones was uh, the so-called center director's uh, briefing, where I was right next to Werner von Braun, Robert Gilruth, uh, Kurt Debus, uh, George Miller, who was the head of manned space flight, uh, we interviewed later, uh, and uh, to um, to me, uh, as a 19-year-old, I was kind of wide-eyed and uh, extremely excited uh, to be right in the middle of this. I'm speaking with David Chudwin, author of I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, From Apollo 11 to Our Future in Space. You can find more information about David's work on his Facebook page, or on the Amazon page for the book. If you like this podcast so far, please subscribe to it and rate it and review it if you can. Please go to my website, technologyinspace.com or spacewalksmoneytalks.com for additional news and science about space exploration and commercialization. You can find the links to my other podcasts and book lists at historyrabbithole.com. That's rabbit as in the animal, historyrabbithole.com. Thank you for your support, and now back to the podcast. How long did it take for you to overcome your awe? Were you able to get to work fairly quickly? or? Well, you know, the, the news cycle was very slow then, and so I was really not on a tremendous deadline uh, to, um, to do stories. I did stories every evening, uh, but there was not the instant communication there is today. Mm -hmm. Did either of you take photographs? Well, one of the, the best things I ever did was I borrowed my dad's old Kodak Retina camera from the 1940s. Mm -hmm. uh, this was an entirely manual camera, but it, it had a good, good lens, a German lens, and, it, and I took three rolls of uh, Kodachrome color slide film. And so um, I, I used that uh, judiciously um, during the trip. And uh, I have been able to um, save the slides uh, from that time, and I kept them in nice, cool, dark condition. And so when the ability to scan slides came out, uh, I um, actually had them scanned twice, uh, once about 12 years ago, the other time about six years ago at very high resolution from a professional photo studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this collection over 100 slides, I think, is a real historic record of Apollo 11. And about six years ago, I started posting them on Facebook in a series of 72 Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. And that kind of led me to write the book because uh, several people told me, that, uh, you know, just from the slides themselves, they could see that I had quite a story that would be worth telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty amazing. Do you recall what specific part of the uh, the ship or the, the supporting infrastructure was most awe-inspiring for you, just that, that really surprised you? Well, I, I think it had to be the vehicle assembly building. Uh, and it's a shame that uh, the, it's there's uh, not the access to it is now that there were years ago, but um, you know, I, I the vehicle assembly building was almost like a cathedral. Uh, it was this giant space that was um, at that time the biggest structure in the world, uh, and um, to, to um, look up uh, at the top of the vehicle assembly building, or more even impressively, to be at the top and then to look down at the floor, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, was 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 very very impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, the the probably the one of the most remarkable sights uh, of those three days was um, the, two nights before the launch. Uh, they took the press out on on buses, and uh, we were 
with, had a vantage point of the Saturn V sitting on Lunch Complex 39 uh, at dusk. And then as it got darker, uh, they turned on these high-intensity xenon lights. And so there was this huge 363-foot rocket uh, with the gantry and the launch tower uh, and these beams of light shooting out from either side. Uh, at, at the time, I kind of described it as a jewel in the night. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it was just an um, incredible sight uh, to see it illuminated like that. Hmm. You, you didn't happen to uh, see any video, or, or were you at uh, in Washington, D.C., when they lit up the, last year they lit up the uh, Washington Monument with a, a, a view of the ship? Um, yeah, I, 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 Chris, I did see pictures of that, and, and it was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, you know, the, the uh, size of the, the, the Saturn V. I, I think it'll be very interesting in the next couple of years uh, as uh, SLS, uh, Space Launch System rocket, is uh, uh, constructed and uh, put on the pad there to, to kind of compare it to, uh, to the Saturn V and how that looked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were there, uh, among the many people who were part of the space program that you saw there, did anyone uh, s particularly stand out for you? Well, I've kind of described the, the Apollo 11 launch as kind of like the Super Bowl of space mm -hmm. in the sense that everybody who was anybody that ever had anything to do with the space program seemed to, to be there. I mean, it ranged from space pioneers like Herman Oberth uh, to... Um, President Lyndon Johnson, who was the, I call him the godfather of the space program, hmm. uh, because he was head of the uh, Senate Space Committee, then vice president, uh, and then as president carried on President Kennedy's goal of reaching the moon by the end of the decade. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there, uh, Jim Webb, the first administrator of NASA, was there. Uh, the, um, you know, we ran in, I ran into all kinds of, uh, you know, astronauts. And, and one of the high points was the ability to have a 20-minute private interview with Dr. George Miller, who was head of the manned space program then. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I later used this interview for a, a magazine article that helped pay, the, pay my way to the, the, uh, to the launch. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Were there any, any of the journalists there? Did anyone stand out as being particularly helpful or insightful? Well, there were like 3,500 journalists there. Yeah. There was a, just a massive amount. And, and for the most part, uh, you know, I was, I and my friend Marv were basically ignored, which was fine with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that, but there were some journalistic stars there. Um, we were, um, taking a walk, uh, through the, um, Cape Kennedy Hilton at the time. And we went out by the swimming pool and they're sitting in a lounge chair surrounded by some people was uh, CBS's Walter Cronkite, uh, who was you know, certainly one of the foremost uh, television journalists of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also I, I was at a remote uh, press conference with the Apollo 11 crew two nights before the launch, uh, where they were in their crew quarters, uh, and the rest of his journalists were at the NASA Apollo 11 News Center. But um, but um, on the panel there was again Walter Cronkite, and uh, um, another uh, well-known print journalist, journalist L. Rossiter Jr., who was uh, for United Press. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it's funny. Last year, um, one of my uh, friends, J.L. Pickering, found a NASA picture from 1969 of that press conference that clearly shows me in mm -hmm. in the crowd of journalists. Yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. Did you, were you, um, stuck at a hotel way out? Uh, I imagine every, so many people were in that, that area at the time that it, it was hard to find accommodations. Well, what, what we had done is the moment, um, Apollo 10 landed in May, uh, I made some phone calls. Again, this is before computers, before the internet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there was a motel in Cocoa Beach called the Sea Missile Motel. Mm -hmm. Uh, which even then was kind of an old, uh, somewhat seedy property, but we were able to get a motel reservation there for the period of, of the launch. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you know, if we would have waited at all, everything was totally booked up for for miles and miles. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it was estimated that uh, up to a million people uh, were in the area for the, the Apollo 11 launch. Hmm. Were there any other reporters at that hotel with you? I don't rem- I don't remember any. Uh, the um, again, this was a very low budget motel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, but still, like you say, there were so many people there. You know, some people probably had to scramble. Yeah, um, yeah. The um, you know logistics uh, then uh, were um, were difficult for NASA with all these reporters there. Uh, so they they had a lot of press buses. Our um, our minibus tour, uh, which took nine of us, you know, to, to every nook and cranny around there, um, that was uh, a couple days before the launch. Um, they had run out of NASA public affairs people, so the the our guide was actually a, a NASA contractor uh, who volunteered to give us the tour. Wow! Did did you have? How did you get from the hotel to the to the area? Did they pick you up with this bus or? No, uh, we we had a rental car uh, that got us to the um, Apollo Eleven News Center. Now, the the regular press site uh, on Kennedy Space Center would have been uh, overwhelmed by thirty five hundred jun- journalists. So NASA actually took over for Apollo Eleven an industrial building along A one A. It was a two story industrial building, and took that over temporarily as the uh, NASA Apollo Eleven uh, News Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the launch. And so uh, it, it wasn't too far a drive from uh, the motel in Cocoa Beach to this uh, building uh, in um, Cape Canaveral. Hmm. Do you recall what um, security was like? Because I can imagine there would be concern that uh, maybe the Soviets might have agents lurking about. You know, it's amazing how lax security was compared by present day standards. Um, we did have a, a press badges. Uh, there were no pictures on it. Uh, it was um, just a, a card encased in plastic with our names uh, and, and that. And just to give you an example of kind of the somewhat lax security, once we were, you know, we, we, um, once we were at the, the, the press site, uh, my friend and I saw a NASA bus and it said VIP site. So we hopped on this bus that took us from the Launch Complex 39 press site, which was on one side of the vehicle assembly building, mm-hmm. to this VIP site, uh, which was on the other side, where they had over, uh, you know, that they had uh, four to five thousand dignitaries there, including President Johnson and uh, you know, and, and all these other people, and uh, uh, they they didn't even look at our badges. Hmm. Yeah. That. <laughs> That's, and and, uh, and the other thing is, I mean, you know, we on these these press tours, uh, we went, um, uh, you know, right up close and personal with the the Saturn V rockets for the next uh, the next missions for Apollo twelve. The it had been stacked. Apollo thirteen, they were in the process of stacking the different stages, and we were right up next to them. Uh, and uh, so the security uh, certainly. Uh, was uh, much, much less than you would see now. Hmm. Did you see many security guards or military guards or anything? Well, there, there, were, um, there were security guards at the gates, of the, at the entrance of the Kennedy Space Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there, were, there were a few security people around. Now, I, uh, you know, from what I've read since then, it, that they did have, uh, you know, in reserve that there were military and, and, and things like that, but, but they were not apparent to us at the time. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I kind of, and I'm asking these questions, one, because maybe these are questions other people haven't asked, and two, I also have sort of a nostalgic feel for, for that era and just get a, you know, getting a feel for what it was like um, to be there. It was very, uh, it was kind of like one big celebration. I mean, you know, obviously there was concern about the, the, the rocket and, uh, you know, the safety of, of the crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's why we were kept over three miles away from the launch pad. Uh, because, uh, if you were closer and there was a mishap and the rocket blew up, you'd, you'd be dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, everybody was kept at least three miles away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, but it, in, you know, in, it was a lot of celebration. I mean, this was a culmination of work by 400,000 people, uh, for eight and a half years. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the um, so there, you know, so some of the companies had like parties uh, beforehand. Uh, there was a lot of anticipation, but but also uh, a lot of uh, excitement and enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the day of the launch, um, wh- where where were you set up? You know, what what did you um what what was the uh, yeah basically how how were you set up? Where did they put you, and and what did you get to see? Well, we I was at the Sea Missile Motel, and we set the alarms for four thirty in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, remembering back, uh, again, there were no cell phones and these were like wind up travel alarm clocks, uh, that, that, uh, that got us awake and then drove to, from the motel to the, this Apollo 11 news center in Cape Canaveral. And then, uh, we had got, gotten lucky and gotten, uh, uh, tickets, um, to see the walkout of the astronauts. So we got on the bus, uh, you know, the, the sun hadn't even risen yet when we first got on the bus. And uh, then it drove us to the Kennedy Space Center uh, through the gates uh, and um, took us to an area it, right in front of uh, what's now called the Armstrong ONC building, but was then called the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, mm-hmm. uh, where the astronaut crew quarters were. So we got out of the bus and we could see that Across from the entrance to the MSOB, uh, there was a roped off area. So as we got off the bus, everybody started running uh, to um, to get the best positions along this rope to see the astronauts. And uh, I've kind of likened it to a rugby scrum. I mean, uh, <laughs> elbows were flying. Uh, everybody was kind of pushing to get the best position. My my friend and I um, got uh, positioned in in the probably about the third row. Which, which wasn't too bad. Uh, so um, we, we all kind of stood there for a while. And um, meanwhile, while we were out there inside, the astronauts were having re- their breakfast and um, getting uh, suited up at, at the time. So around, um, so a- after maybe 45 minutes or so, um, uh, Deke Slayton, who was the chief astronaut at the time, uh, emerged and walked down the walkway and was interviewed by a um, TV reporter we couldn't hear uh, what he said. And then a little bit after 6.30 in the morning, there was a, a light bulbs were flashing and there was cheering and the astronauts uh, walked out, uh, Armstrong uh, and then uh, Collins and then Aldrin uh, in their white spacesuits, walked down the ramp and to the Astrovan. And this was really, besides the launch, the high point of the trip. Uh, we were seeing the last steps on Earth, mm-hmm. literally, of the first men to set foot on the moon. Do you recall their faces? Did they look very serious or happy or relaxed? What, what do you recall? Oh, no, they, 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 they were very happy. Uh, Armstrong had a big grin on his face. Uh, he did a thumbs up both inside the, the building and then after he came outside. Uh, I was able to get some pictures uh, at, at the time, hmm. and that was kind of an adventure in itself because everybody was jostling for position. <laughs> there were elbows flying, and uh, I wasn't even sure if any of the pictures turned out because there, you know, there were no electronic cameras on. There was film, hmm. and it had to be developed. Hmm. And so I didn't see these pictures until I had got home and got them back after developing two weeks later. And uh, I, you know, I was thrilled that some of these pictures turned out, including one that uh, shows all three of the astronauts, and uh, I, I think is a unique record of that event. Mm-hmm. And I'll say it that you know, film at the time wasn't necessarily expensive, but buying film and then processing it wasn't cheap either. So you kind of had to be judicious, I think, when taking pictures. Right. Like I said, I brought three rolls of uh, 36, mm-hmm. and uh, I was able to get um, five shots off of the walkout, and um, uh, two of them turned out uh, really good. Mm-hmm. So then a- after that, a- after seeing this wondrous event of men leaving for the moon, uh, the next thing that happened was we got caught in a massive traffic jam uh, with all these people there. Even uh, inside Kennedy Space Center, there were, there was like bumper to bumper traffic. Mm-hmm. So eventually, we made it to the 
Launch Complex 39 press site. And like I, I just previously said, we took a bus and actually watched the launch from this VIP site. Uh, these were low grandstands for special invited guests. And it was really, really a wide range of people there. I mean, there were entertainers like uh, Johnny Carson and Ed, Ed McMahon. Hmm. Uh, there were um, uh, senators there. There were uh, all kinds of um, current and former government uh, people. Representing the Kennedy family was Sergeant Shriver, uh, who was uh, uh, President Kennedy's uh, uh, brother-in-law. Hmm. Uh, we, we saw him there. There was the Army Chief, Chief of Staff William Westmoreland, uh, who had been the U.S. commander in uh, Vietnam, was there. Hmm. Uh, just a very wide, wide, wide range of people. What was it a hot day? I know Florida in July is can be oppressive. Uh, it was it was warm and humid, but not oppressively hot. But again, this this was early in the morning. Hmm. The launch was scheduled for nine thirty two. Yeah. And uh, you know, but when we had gotten there, uh, you know, it was still still uh, reasonable. It got uh, warmer as as the morning went on. So my friend and I set up shop a couple hundred yards in front of these grandstands, and the view that we had of the Saturn V rocket uh, was across this huge field of, uh, of uh, grass. Mm -hmm. So that my, my pictures, you know, most pictures of the launch from the press site show water, you know, that there was a, a basin uh, between the press site and uh, Launch Complex 39, but uh, my pictures just show this long expanse of, of grass there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but precisely at 9.32 in the morning, there was a yellow-orange dot of what was flame um, that we could see from three miles away underneath the rocket. And then suddenly, uh, flames and smoke shot out from either side of the, uh, of the uh, Saturn V. It was totally silent. Uh, again, uh, you know, we were three miles away. Time takes sound takes time to to propagate. So the the rocket ignites. Um, there's flames and smoke shooting out from either side, and it's totally silent. Hmm. Then the rocket just sits there for a couple of seconds, and I was actually concerned at the time that there was some sort of problem uh, because it was belching flame and just kind of sitting there. <laughs> and then very very gradually it started to, to rise up. Now, if you've ever seen a shuttle launch, when the solid rocket boosters um, go off, it really shoots up quickly. Well, this huge Saturn V just kind of sat there and very slowly um, rose um, off the launch pad. It took a full 10 seconds for the rocket to clear the tower. Mm -hmm. And about that time, the sound hit us. And we not only saw the launch, we felt the launch. These sound waves pounded on our chests, and there, there was a physical sen sensation to it. And then the sound got louder and louder, and um, there was this extremely loud crackling sound. You could feel the sound waves, and as the rocket rose, we could actually feel some, some heat, some warmth from the 7.5 million pounds of, of thrust. Wow. I'm speaking with David Chudwin, author of I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, From Apollo 11 to Our Future in Space. You can find more information about David's work on his Facebook page or on the Amazon page for the book. If you like this podcast so far, please subscribe to it and rate it and review it if you can. Please go to my website, technologyinspace.com or spacewalksmoneytalks.com for additional news and science about space exploration and commercialization. You can find the links to my other podcasts and book lists at historyrabbithole.com. That's rabbit as in the animal, historyrabbithole.com. Thank you for your support, and now back to the podcast. So how long did it take before it disappeared from view? And I'm talking about the rocket, and I guess the smoke lingered. Right, well, the, um, the, the, the rocket... Uh as it cleared the launch tower, started to go a little bit quicker. And as time went on, it, it accelerated even faster. Mm -hmm. And so we probably, um, in the, so we could see it going up. And then eventually, after about two minutes, 
all we could see was a little dot of, uh, of light in the sky uh, as, as it rose further in, in the atmosphere. Was there a, a, some sort of a loudspeaker um, providing information during this period of the launch? Yeah. Yes, um, at the VIP site, they did have loudspeakers, and there was the voice of um, Launch Control, uh, who was uh, Jack King at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Jack had a very distinctive voice, and uh, he provided commentary until it cleared the tower. And then it was taken over, the commentary was taken over in, uh, in Houston. And uh, I believe that the public affairs officer in Houston uh, was Jack Riley. After it seemed to disappear, what what happened? Was did everyone just kind of look around and or start scribbling their notes, or how did that work? Well, again, I was at the VIP site, so um, what what we did was try and mingle with with all the VIPs and get quotes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you know that's when I talked to uh, you know Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, I I met Fred Fred Hayes, the Apollo thirteen astronaut, who's actually become a friend of mine. Uh, there for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I got some quotes from him. He was the backup uh, lunar module pilot and had uh, been in the spacecraft uh, setting all the the uh, measurements there and everything in, in the spacecraft earlier before the launch. Uh, so I was able to talk to him for a few minutes. We saw um, we saw Vice President Agnew uh, uh, had, had been there uh, as well. And um, it... Uh, you know, it was just quite a scene there, uh, you know, and it, it, people gradually left. Uh, my friend and I went back to the motel and took a swim, hmm. actually. Yeah. Were there, since you mentioned that there were some, uh, po some political opposition to this, did you happen to see any protests or were you aware of any protests um, the day of the launch? Um, yeah, I, I didn't actually see it, but uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy and, and some of his uh, um, followers were there to uh, protest the space program that the money spent on getting to the moon, uh, you know, should be spent uh, alleviating poverty uh, and, and, and that. So there, there were some small scale protests, but it's far outnumbered by uh, the, um, you know, the, the people that were excited about uh, fulfilling President Kennedy's goal of getting to the moon. Mm hmm. Yeah. So how um how much longer did did you stay there after the launch? Well, most of the journalists flew to Houston, but you know, I didn't have the money to do that. I mean, I my press pass was good for both Kennedy Space Center and Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, hmm. but uh you know, I couldn't afford that. So I stayed at the Sea Missile Motel uh and the um by the way, the the rate for the Sea Missile Motel was $10 a night. Mm -hmm. Again, this is pre-inflation dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I stayed at the Sea Missile Motel, uh, uh, did some uh, touristing and, uh, you know, wrote, wrote some stories. Uh, and uh, I um, actually watched the moon landing from the NASA News Center uh, in Cape Canaveral. I was, I was in the press room there uh, for the landing. Hmm. So d it sounds like perhaps you got a little bit of a, a perspective on the landing that other people, other people didn't. Right. It was, um, you know, m many of the journalists had left. There were maybe like two or 300 of us left there. Mm -hmm. Um, it was interesting because a lot of them were foreign reporters again, for the same reason that they, they didn't have it in their budget to go to Houston. <laughs> uh, and so there was a kind of a cacophony of foreign languages at, at the press center a lot of the um, you know exhibits that the industrial companies had put up in the press center there were were empty. Uh, the NASA people still put out um, regular uh, stenographic transcripts of the air to ground communication, and uh, luckily I flew down there with a half filled suitcase on purpose, and I came back and it was full of a stack of uh, air to ground transcripts, uh, probably six inches uh, in in height. Wow. Uh, of of all that, and uh, it's uh, uh, you know interesting to to look look back through them. But um, the the landing though um, was uh, in the uh, afternoon. Uh, it was uh, around four o'clock, four nineteen to be exact. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was very exciting to to sit there. I was 
I didn't sit in front of the, the televisions because uh, what I did was I sat and along these long press tables that they had where there were telephones and typewriters and I scribbled notes uh, as the, the stuff, as the, um, the air to ground came in over the uh, loudspeakers they had there, the squawk boxes. And I, I remember how scary it was um, before, before the landing. Uh, and um, at, at the time, um, you know, we didn't know what these computer alarms meant. Uh, we, we knew that, they, that uh, Neil Armstrong was, was, uh, needed to land fairly quickly or he was going to end up running out of fuel mm -hmm. uh, and, and that. And so when Charlie Dukes, when, when Neil said, uh, uh, Tranquility Base here, the legal Eagle has landed, and then Charlie Duke, the Capcom, said, well, you've got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. <laughs> I, told, I, I totally understood what, what he meant. Uh, it was a very, for me, it was a very emotional uh, moment. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I had a few tears in my eyes at, at, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I thought about the Apollo 1 crew who had, had uh, perished uh, uh, two and a half years before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I thought about uh, President Kennedy, who had kind of started this whole process, uh, and it was a, a very special time. To me, the moon, the, actually stepping on the moon, was was a symbolic act. To me, that really didn't mean that much, mm -hmm. and to me, that wasn't really that important. What what was the real achievement and uh, the real triumph was safely landing on the moon. Because mm -hmm. if I recall. Actually, um, the landing site, there was a bit of a problem with the actual landing site. So I think they had to do some quick adjustment and, and kind of shift over where they were landing, you know, a little bit, if I recall correctly. Right. Well, the, the um, you know, they didn't have the gravity. There are these um, mass cons or that, that would have, that affected the, um, the uh, flight uh, over the moon. And so that... Um, it ended up that they were going long, that they were going uh, past their original launch site. And the area to which Armstrong was heading was loaded with boulders and would have been very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So he took over manual control from the computer and very calmly found a, uh, you know, a clear spot and, and landed it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, was, it was a tremendous uh, amount of uh, skilled piloting on the part of uh, Armstrong's part. Mm -hmm. Do you recall any other instances, maybe not well known, where there seemed to be some danger or concern that was overcome? Well, one of the concerns was what the Russians were doing, because um, at the time, U.S. intelligence knew that um, that they were going to try and scoop, <laughs> bad pun, were going to try and scoop the Americans by sending an unmanned uh, spacecraft there and bring back some soil before the Americans, mm -hmm. uh, this Zahn spacecraft. And there was, there was concern of that this would, uh, you know, that their spacecraft would somehow interfere uh, with, with Apollo 11. And uh, so that, that there was, um, you know, there, there was some serious concern there as to what the Russians were up to at the time. Mm -hmm. But nothing, obviously, nothing came of it, or right. And and there was, uh, you know, some hi uh, high level uh, communication between the Russians and and the U.S. that was uh, secret at the time, uh, you know, assuring that it would that they were not going to interfere with, uh, you know, with with the U.S. Uh, spacecraft or landing. Hmm. Yeah. So then. Um... The return back to the Earth. Did you um, were you still there for that, or did you had you did you leave? No, I, I had to leave. I had a, a, a return home, so I was not there uh, for for the landing. But I ran into the Apollo 11 crew literally um, uh, a few weeks later uh, when they returned to Chicago for a uh, massive ticker tape parade on August 13, 1969. Mm -hmm. Were you able to um, speak to anyone involved uh, with the program there, who was who was there for the parade? 
Uh, no, but what I, you know, I, I fished out my NASA press pass mm -hmm. and uh, and took that to the parade, and I was able to kind of run along the limousine uh, for um, at least a small section of it and get some close-up pictures of the um, of the astronauts there. Uh, it was uh, quite a impressive um, a scene, mm -hmm. and uh, the um, I finally had to um, stop my uh, coverage of it when I ran out of uh, I ran out of uh, film. You know, uh, again, this was uh, uh, photographic film and not electronic cameras, mm -hmm. and uh, and then also I was threatened with arrest by a Chicago policeman if I didn't get back on the sidewalk. Uh, <laughs> He didn't care about the NASA pass. No. <laughs> so, and I guess Chicago in August. So this might, it would have been August at this point, maybe or close. Yeah, it was to. August thirteenth. Yeah. Uh, it, they the astronauts had been in quarantine, and they were, had been released from quarantine. I believe the the day day or two before, uh, and then um, President Nixon orchestrated this amazing day where they did take ticker tape parade in New York in the morning, Chicago in the afternoon, and then L.A. in the evening. Wow. And they had a, a special uh, dinner honoring the Apollo 11 crew that Nixon was at where he presented them the Presidential Medal of Freedom mm -hmm. uh, that night. I, I'm sure they slept pretty good that night. I hope so, after all that. So what did uh, the reporting that came out of this, did it do anything for your college's, college paper's prestige, or was there any kind of anything associated with that? Again, um, there was only marginal interest uh, about the space program uh, at, at that time, at least uh, in the non-engineering schools. Hmm. And so I, I did get some nice comments and uh, compliments uh, on on the coverage, uh, but um, again, it was just kind of a, a, a blip in what else was happening in in the world at the time. Hmm. Uh, the summer of 1969 was a very remarkable summer, uh, and um, if if you remember back, or if in some way or another, uh, in the summer of 1969. Uh, there was also a music festival called Woodstock. Right. And uh, I actually had to make a choice between going to Apollo 11 or going to Woodstock. I had a summer job that uh, summer uh, selling men's clothing on a, at a men's clothing store in Michigan Avenue in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I took the job with the understanding that I would be able to take only one week off during the summer because uh, the boss needed me uh, to, to cover for employees who were on vacation. So it, it to make a long story short, it came down to a choice between going to Woodstock or to Apollo 11. Hmm. You know, I've, I've heard, you, and let me know what the case is, um, I've heard that, yeah, Woodstock was popular, but it wasn't as big at the time as it's made out. You know, like historically speaking, people look back and make it a huge thing. Um, was it, was it as big a thing nationwide as, as people make it out to be now? Uh, I agree. It wasn't quite as big, but on the other hand, the, uh, the musical acts that were scheduled to appear there, uh, made it somewhat a big, uh, somewhat of a big deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it wasn't kind of the mythic event, uh, that, that it is now. Mm -hmm. And so I could take either this week off in July to go to Apollo 11 or a week off in August to, to go to Woodstock. So um, I, I decided to do Apollo 11. I, I figured that there'd be future music festivals, uh, but uh, yeah. there probably hopefully would not be another launch to be the first to land on the moon. Yeah. Um, so I know. So from your bio, you eventually ended up going into medicine. You didn't um, stay necessarily with space, except you continued on um, on the side following space, right? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Um, I had a choice to make, and instead of going into journalism, uh, I decided to, um, you know, to go, go the medicine path. You know, some people have asked me, well, did you want to be an astronaut? Well, I did want to be an astronaut, you know, when I was like, you know, eight or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I ran into the face of reality. I have a terrible eyesight. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I also am mildly claustrophobic. And being claustrophobic is probably not the best recipe for being an astronaut. Yeah. I think every kid wanted to be an astronaut. And, and reality kind of, uh, I, I mean, it's super competitive. Even tons of people who are capable of being astronauts, you know, didn't go up. Did you have uh, any interest in, in getting into um, aerospace medicine? Actually, um I thought about that at one point, but um, it, it was kind of a, a difficult uh, field to get into. And um, most, a lot of people in aerospace medicine were in, in the military. And uh, again, at, at that time, uh, the war in Vietnam was uh, uh, raging quite a bit. And I really did not want to go into the military at, at, at that point. Mm-hmm. I have had, uh, you know, since then I've been an occasional reviewer for um, some uh, scientific research papers about space medicine. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's your specialty, your medical specialty? Uh, I'm in uh, allergy and immunology. Okay. Very appropriate for for how things are going now. So um, I know that once the space program, once the Apollo program shut down, I'm aware that a lot of a lot of people involved in the program were out of work. It was a pretty rough time, from what I hear. Um, what, what are your impressions of? And I know that the amount of money they spent on the Apollo program was was huge compared to the the um, the uh, public budget as a whole. What are your thoughts about about that that period when things slowed down? Well, it, it was ironic that um, that a number of the people that worked very hard um, on getting Apollo 11 to the moon, uh, that in 1969 the space budget was being cut, again, um, in large measure due to budget pressures from the Vietnam War, uh, and that these people that had worked so hard were getting pink slips that, that they were going to um, you know, lose their jobs. Uh, you know, it's estimated that over 400,000 people, uh, both at NASA, but also mainly at different contractors, uh, contributed uh, to um, the success of landing on the moon. And so just as they were being successful, their quote-unquote reward uh, for their efforts uh, was to, to be getting uh, laid off. Mm-hmm. But there was still, I think, um, pretty good morale uh, at, at the Space Center at, at the time, but, but there was this kind of angst about uh, the job possibilities in, in the future. And uh, at its high point in 1966, NASA got almost 5% of the entire U.S. budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, within a few years, it was down to less than 1% of the entire U.S. budget. Mm-hmm. So it, it had been cut, uh, been, been cut tremendously, uh, and then this this continued through the um, through the shuttle years, and it's it's interesting. In order to save money, decisions were made about design of the space shuttle, which eventually rendered it uh, too uh, dangerous to to fly. Mm-hmm. That that's that's a whole other uh, study and conversation. But uh, th- there were a lot of compromises in the early 1970s uh, when NASA first uh, presented a uh, shuttle design to Nixon, who was actually not no friend of the space program. Hmm. Uh, and uh, they were kind of forced to kind of buy in cheap for the shuttle program, and it resulted in an inherently unsafe design. It makes me wonder, So you, so since you've witnessed this, from then till now, what what do you see as having renewed interest in space? Well, that, that's an excellent question, and and the answer to that is the um, private entrepreneurs, the so-called internet billionaires, who've poured hundreds of millions of dollars of their own money uh, it, to revitalize the um, the space program. And the you know the two most prominent but not the only examples are Elon Musk with SpaceX and Jeff Bezos with uh, Blue Origin, mm-hmm. and uh, these um, companies have been able to um, launch and do things um, less expensive than NASA or the traditional contractors, 
and and also they've been able to think outside the box. You know, the um, one of the reasons for the cost of space tra travel has been the uh, the huge expense involved. And one of the reasons for the huge expense is every time in the past that they've used a rocket, they've thrown it out. It would be like flying from Chicago to Seattle, you know, on a jet. And then each time you fly, you'd throw out the jet. I mean, that's that's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but what SpaceX especially has been trying to do is to develop reusability of, um, of space rockets. And, and this brings down the cost uh, um, significantly. So... I think it's a combination of this um, new way of thinking than the traditional NASA or contractor way, and then also the, the additional money uh, that's that's been put into it. And I, I think that the current model of a private government partnership, such as was just demonstrated with the Demo 2 mission, uh, is the, the way to go in, in the future. And, and that's why I'm optimistic. Um, NASA had become kind of risk averse and had been kind of become kind of bureaucratic and had a uh, limited uh, budget. And the um, infusion of private money and ideas has, has really um, revitalized everything. Do you think that um, the technology and engineering reached a point where someone like Musk or Bezos would jump on board and do this or did it or was it more driven by individuals who wanted to make this happen? I think a lot of it has to do with 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 the individuals uh, in, involved. Um, I think that uh, um, both um, Musk and, and Bezos have a, a very innate interest in uh, in uh, science and in technology mm -hmm. and that uh, you know that, that they they're putting their money where their mouth is, uh, and they're also you know really um, smart businessmen, and you know if if you look ahead, you know in, in the long run to ten, twenty, thirty years from now, uh, the what the money that they put into this could end up being a very very good investment for them, uh, as uh, there's money to be made. Uh, with all kinds of um, industries in space. Space tourism is going to get off the ground probably this year or next year. Uh, there's um, you know, serious studies of mining the moon or mining asteroids for precious metals. Uh, and so this may be the start of um, what's been called a spacefaring civilization. In other words, us not being just uh, stuck here on Earth uh, but expanding uh, human presence to other parts of the solar system. Mm -hmm. What do you think about current efforts to um, to get more Americans interested in space and also to get more Americans um, studying engineering and well, STEM in general? Well, I, I think that that's important. I mean, if you look at the statistics of, um, you know, of, of PhDs and of uh, training programs, uh, you know, the United States has fallen behind uh, many, um, many other countries. And uh, again, I mean, the, the, the Chinese, for example, are turning out uh, huge numbers of, uh, you know, well-trained uh, scientists and engineers uh, from um, being a very poor country, uh, you know, 80, 100 years ago. Um, it's the Chinese are never, now very advanced. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're going to end up giving us kind of a run for our money in science and technology in the years ahead mm -hmm. uh, because of a very organized, well-funded, uh, and well-planned uh, space program. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Springer Publishing, but they do a lot of, um, they publish a lot on on space science, and, and those papers and books seem to be dominated uh, or or most of the authors seem to be Chinese or, or at least have Chinese names, um, overwhelmingly so. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I, I think that, that, again, looking way ahead, uh, that, um, that that's going to be one of our uh, main, uh, com that China's could be one of our main competitors uh, in, in space. And uh, so the, the question is, um, 
you know, uh, along the political route, you know, will it be friendly competition or will it be unfriendly competition? Mm -hmm. One thing I wonder about is, you know, that the laws about space have, you know, space is a communal resource. Um, but, you know, if you start going to space and, and mining the moon or mining other um, other bodies out in space, you know, where where you know, what are the laws as far as who can do what and how much, you know, if it's communal, you know, you're going to have challenges with, um, with sorting that out. Well, I, you know, I mean, there's an old saying, possession is nine tenths of the law. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm not, I, you know, I'm frankly, you know, I mean, th these are issues that need to be looked at, but I'm not too, uh, you know, I'm not too concerned about that as, as being a, a practical problem. Uh, I think, uh, whoever gets out there first is going to, going to um, take in quite a haul mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that. And, uh, you know, the, the future for space commerce, uh, I think, is is really good, not so much in the short run over the next, you know, five, ten years, but over the next 20, 30 years, uh, I think that, uh, that there's going to be a tremendous push by private industry, you know, aided by government to uh, take advantage of the economic resources in space. What are your thoughts on um, going to Mars? How, how should that, what should be the goal? How should it be managed? Because it's expensive and, you know, some people might wonder what, why go to Mar why spend the money going to Mars when there are other things we could do? What's, what's your ideas on that? Chris, getting to Mars is hard, a lot harder than people realize. The moon is 250,000 miles or about three days away from Earth. Mars is many, many million miles away. Uh, and a journey there takes uh, months. And so there's all kinds of uh, issues about long time uh, in space uh, for humans. The studies on the International Space Station have shown that there are a variety of uh, medical issues uh, that, that arise. Um, some of these include uh, effects on the immune system, effects on the eyes, the balance system, uh, and uh, bone loss. And so that there's a number of medical issues in low Earth orbit, and this is compounded by going to Mars because of the long time in microgravity and then also uh, potential radiation exposure. Cosmic rays are um, uh, reduced as a result of the, the atmosphere, uh, whereas there uh, will be um, increased uh, exposure on a, on a flight to Mars. So one of the problems getting to Mars are these medical issues. Another um, problem is the um, issue of what, uh, how much weight, uh, you know, can, can be sent there in the, the size of, of rockets. Mm -hmm. NASA had kind of anticipated uh, sending missions to Mars in the 2030s, but um, Elon Musk uh, has this uh, proposal to uh, use a large rocket to uh, send people to, to Mars uh, in, in this decade. Hmm. Uh, I do think, though, that probably the, the first trip to Mars may not necessarily be a landing on Mars, but may be a trip to one of the moons of uh, Mars, because uh, that is a lot um, less complicated than having to develop a, a Mars lander, a Mars ascent vehicle, as, as opposed to just going in orbit uh, around Mars. So what aspect of Mars's moons make them um, an easier uh, easier spot to go to? The, um, the reason is is that you, they don't have uh, the gravity that Mars has. Mm -hmm. uh, even though Mars has you know less gravity uh, because it's smaller than, than the Earth, you still uh, need to develop a spacecraft to both land there, and also to get back in, into orbit around Mars. So you would need the equivalent of a uh, Martian uh, lunar module, except a, be, I guess a Mars module mm -hmm. uh, would be needed. Whereas with a, a trip to the moons of Mars and orbit around Mars, it would be, uh, again, not exactly the same analogy, but something like Apollo 8, where you, you fire a big rocket and get the people in orbit uh, and then to get back to the Earth is is not as difficult as to get back to the Earth from the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. Now, um, looking at uh, sort of the whole gamut of business technology and, and policy 
in regards to space. Do you see any challenges that could actually be fixed pretty easily right now, but but aren't being addressed? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, for example, what, one of the things you brought up before was the legal basis of uh, uh, mineral exploitation in, in space. I mean, that type of framework uh, could could be brought up. Uh, I think another area that needs to be looked at in more detail is, uh, uh, you know, threats to Earth from uh, from asteroids and and other bodies uh, that uh, could um, could cause actually uh, the the death of civilization. Uh, I you know uh, Rusty Schweikart, the Apollo Nine astronaut, and and others have really suggested that uh, we need to do more in terms of uh, protecting Earth by developing ways to uh, divert uh, any type of um, meteors or um, uh, bodies that, that, that could crash into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I think that can be done in, in the near term. Uh, and I, I think that government regulations uh, need to be uh, um, streamlined uh, so that people that want to go into space don't have as many regulatory hurdles uh, as, uh, as they do now. Mm -hmm. Are there any issues, again, since you've you've been able to um to watch the issue is it you know watch space exploration and commercialization over the decades are there any other issues or concerns that you'd like to mention the one issue is um use of commercial space by nasa and by the department of defense mm -hmm. uh these these companies uh like spacex need government contracts to uh to survive uh, and there's been kind of a, a tendency, especially on the part of the Defense Department, to use kind of these expensive legacy contractors. Uh, and uh, I, I just read that uh, recently that the Department of Defense gave a large launch contract to um, United Launch Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of these legacy contractors. Uh, and and I, I think that uh, it's important for the government to support uh, some of these other players uh, as as well, and uh, this is um, this is something where the um, private companies are not going to be able to do it alone unless they have government support. I know that uh, I often see Boeing get slammed a lot by people as being a, a company that um, is pretty expensive and embedded with the government, but uh, doesn't seem to deliver as much as it should. Um, I don't know if it's fair or not, but uh, I do notice those comments. Well, it, it, it's interesting that um, NASA decided rightly to um, develop a commercial crew program that would launch astronauts from U.S. soil to the International Space Station. And there, in the commercial crew program, there was a comp actually kind of a competition over a, a number of years of, um, of the companies to do this. And so in the end... The, the two companies that got the contracts were SpaceX and Boeing. So it's been kind of a, a race between SpaceX and Boeing as to launching uh, U.S. astronauts from, from U.S. soil. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, um, the um, Boeing attempt with the commer CST, Commercial Space Transport 100, uh, and Atlas V combination uh, – was a um, was a disaster. There were all kinds of programming errors, and their their unmanned test flight uh, uh, was not uh, successful. On the other hand, uh, SpaceX, uh, you know, recently had this uh, very successful demo two mission with Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin going to the International Space Station, staying there for two months, and coming back safely. Yet, if if you look at the numbers, Boeing received almost twice as much as SpaceX from NASA um, for the, the same type of services. And so, again, um, the, the, the question is, um, who do you support? Do you support the, the, um, the smaller private companies that have more imagination and are more nimble? Or do you go with these legacy contractors like, uh, like Boeing, which has had, certainly had its, its share of problems? Not not only with the CST-100, but also uh, with the uh, um, Boeing jet and also uh, with the uh, space launch system as well. I wonder if the, the lobby, the lobbyists for the 
you know, these legacy companies are stronger than, than the lobbyists for, for those fighting for, you know, the smaller companies. I, I think that's, but also the political process is involved. I mean, th there's a joke that SLS, which is Space Launch System, is actually Senate Launch System <laughs> because it's been supported so strongly by senators, for example, from Alabama, where the Marshall Space Flight Center is, is located. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's all these kind of political uh, con considerations uh, at, at, as well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, some people have even wondered whether it's whether the billions of dollars that have been poured into SLS uh, will eventually pay off at all, or whether it would be better to use uh, Falcon Heavy or uh, a SpaceX uh, rocket uh, to to achieve the same goals at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. Though I feel like um, a lot of this money, even if the program itself isn't successful, I feel like this money helps develop uh, science. Um, that can be used in other fields, you know, that it that it spreads out in different ways that maybe people aren't necessarily paying attention to. Well, you, you know, people at the time of Apollo 11 were saying, why do you spend money on the moon, uh, you know, when there's poverty and, and things like that? Well, the, the point is, is that the, the money is not being spent on the moon or on Mars. It's being spent right here on Earth, mm -hmm. uh, providing jobs and providing advanced technology. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm I'm sitting here at my tiny laptop, uh, talking to you, and uh, the um, the only computers that were available in 1969 were these huge mainframe computers that would take up a whole room. One of the impetuses to develop uh, computer technology was the space program. The same thing with medical monitoring. We have all these um, incredible. Uh, ways to uh, remotely monitor uh, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, things like that. And a lot of the medical instrumentation uh, was developed as a result of the, um, the, the space program. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been all kinds of other benefits, uh, weather, weather forecasting, crop monitoring, help with uh, Earth resources. Uh, all these things have uh, been so-called spin-offs of the, of the space program. So I, th I think that the uh, space program is a, a good investment for the United States, that taxpayers get their money worth out of it, and that uh, it's a, um, a good investment uh, for us. Yeah. I mean, it, it's technology that has um, increased quality of life and, and, and saved, made life better and longer and, and saved lives. So the things you mentioned. At this point in time, what excites you about space? I, I think what excites me about space is kind of taking the long view that, you know, human beings evolved in Africa, uh, you know, millions of, of years ago and then spread to the different continents. Uh, and then uh, with uh, airplanes spread to the atmosphere and now are, are spreading to, to, to space. So, um, it, it's a whole uh, new environment, a whole new ocean. And I, I think that if we take the long view, um, it's important to look at space kind of as a lifeboat for life here on Earth. Uh, you know, it may not happen, uh, you know, now or centuries from now uh, or even millennia from now, uh, but the, there is a threat, a long-term existential threat uh, to, to life on Earth. Uh, and whether this is from an asteroid or from global warming, uh, but it, I think it behooves human beings to become a space-faring civilization and, uh, and to set up outposts on the moon, to set up outposts on Mars and, uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, the, um, this will be an insurance policy for, for human beings, for mankind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So um, just to turn back to the book now, uh, to wrap things up and, and mention the book again, uh, let me ask you, uh, the, the title, I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, does that play off all the old uh, monster movies that I was a teenage werewolf or I was a teenage whatever? Exactly. And I wish I could claim credit for that title, but it was actually my book agent mm -hmm. uh, who came uh, came up with, with that title. Mm -hmm. uh, 
my original title uh, was the was the subtitle from Apollo 11 to Our Future in Space. Uh, but uh, I, he came up with the, uh, I was a teenage space reporter, and I was uh, very happy he did. Yeah. So in the book itself, um, it's described as covering many of the topics we discussed, both your your time covering Apollo 11 and then lessons learned. And then you talk about uh, the future, the current and future state of space exploration in the book. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so where can people find you on the web, social media, website, that sort of thing? Well, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much an open book. Um, I have a Facebook site under my name, David Chudwin, and my uh, email uh, is, is open and public, too. It's just my name, david.chudwin at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. uh, the book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the other online booksellers. It is also available in some cities, uh, in actually uh, in Barnes and Noble stores on on the shelves, hmm. uh, and uh, this is um, true in uh, in a number of the, a number of cities. And uh, I, I felt really good about that. It's very very hard to get books by first first authors actually on the shelves of bookstores because the space there is at a premium. Oh yeah, and, and the book on Amazon it has five of five uh, ratings. Um, which is, <laughs> I guess, as good as you can get. Um, and I'll spell your name for listeners. Uh, David Chudwin is D-A-V-I-D, and then Chudwin, C-H-U-D-W-I-N. It's been, it been fun talking with you. It's been a real wide-ranging conversation, and uh, I appreciate all the good questions. All right, yeah, I appreciate you talking with me. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, technology and space please subscribe to it and rate it and review it if you can you can find more great information on my website spacewalksmoneytalks.com or technologyandspace.com you can find more interesting science news and business articles on my social media sites on youtube spacewalks money talks on my facebook page spacewalks money talks on my twitter account spacewalks mt and on my Instagram account, Spacewalks Money Talks. You can also sign up for my newsletter at technologyandspace.com, where I provide updates on space and science books being published. Thank you for listening.